So today I'll be talking about sort of the, the history of Psychid HEP, how this uh, organization sort of started, and sort of how we've come together and you know, now ship about uh, 30 or 40 different um, Python packages for a variety of different needs. So I'm going to start, uh, since this is about Psychid HEP, I'm going to start talking about uh, HEP itself, that's high energy physics, and uh, talk a little bit about the history of um, Python and how that, how that was used. So um, I will start back in 19, roughly around 1994. Fortran was used quite heavily in high energy physics at that point. And uh, there, we were coming up with a, a need to, to move to a new language. And uh, this was right at the time of Python 1.0. A few physicists were playing around with Python and uh, talking with Guido at the time. But uh, actually, uh, C++ ended up getting uh, chosen. And this package called root was created. And uh, this is both a, a toolkit that provides a, just a massive amount of different um, needs for high energy physicists, as well as a, uh, a file format. And you'll kind of see, see it both show up here. And, um, and a few years later, about 10 years later, uh, PyRoot was introduced, which was the official bindings to root. Uh, we'll see those in a second. And, uh, but this didn't really fill in all the needs for a sort of a Python-centric um, uh, ecosystem. And as the, the scientific ecosystem started building around uh, Python, you started seeing a variety of different um, attempts to uh, sort of combine the, the two worlds and, and provide something that you know, high energy physicists could use and take advantage of NumPy and all these other um, things that have been added. And so you see some, some thir third party work. And then in 2016 is, is when uh, scikit-hep was uh, introduced. So let's look at root. Uh, root is a, uh, the, it was a C++ toolkit, but it does have this, this Python interface. Uh, when I say that root was not very Pythonic, I, want, I wanted to give you a little demonstration of what I meant by not Pythonic. So this is an example of opening up a file, and then you're opening up a tree, and a tree is this sort of a, a um, jagged array structure. We'll see, we'll see a sort of a, little, a more example, uh, another example of it, but you can think of it like a, an array at this point. Um, and then you have to create some memory for your pointers, and then you give give it that those pointers. You have to tell it in text what uh, the data type is. Uh, you can go through, you fill in each of those values. It's the same value each time. And you call dot fill, and then it reads from that pointer. And then you call write on the on the original file, not the the thing that you were that you're actually filling. It's it's stored in the file, and then you close. Because this is sort of this is sort of what uh, people um, who are coming in with Python knowledge were were having to write to try to, in this case, like write a file. Okay. And this is classic Pyroot. Uh, Pyroot has gotten better, um, but this is sort of what existed back in 20, certainly even by 2016. Okay. But Python was actually sneaking into high energy physics anyway, uh, and this was through experiment frameworks. So with experiment frameworks, uh, they, they had these large C++ applications, millions of lines of code, um, but they needed to be, uh, they had a tremendous amount of configurability, and they were doing that through Python because Python glues is such a nice glue language into C++. So you'd actually run your, your experiment framework through, um, through Python. And Python was also showing up for various smaller needs as sort of a scripting language. And then in um, uh, analysis, it was also sneaking in there. Um, a lot of students were coming in, and they already had Python knowledge. They were familiar with NumPy and these other tools. And they really wanted to stay in this, this environment that they knew. And root was its own completely separate environment. You couldn't just pip install root. You had to spend several hours building root, and then you had, you had to tie it to a specific Python. It did, didn't talk nicely with the rest of the system. Uh, so uh, there started some of these extra packages were starting to show up, like root numpy, root pandas, to provide nicer bridges in. And by around 2015, you could really do a lot of uh, a high energy physics analysis in the Python stack, but there were just a few domain specific things missing. And there's some examples down here. Um, the, the data, of course, you had these root data files you needed to read. Um, fitting was something that was really important in high energy physics and wasn't really um, powerful enough. Um, and you had you know, uh, some other different uh, things there, especially jagged data, which was very important for us. This idea that you had um, a data set that 
would have a different number, say you'd have a different number of tracks per event, you'd have a different number of hits per track, and uh, these were not rectangular data sets. So around 2015, this is what a data analysis stack looked like. You have um, your, uh, you'd have root data, which you'd read into PyRoot, and this Python ecosystem was something you just had to sort of fight with to try to, to, to use. Another way that you could do it is you could also take your uh, root data, you could then convert it to some other format and then use it inside this data science stack and then occasionally have to go back and forth between these sort of two different worlds. Now what you would really like is something that looks like this and this is what uh, scikit-hep was trying to provide, some way to live entirely inside this Python ecosystem and do your entire analysis inside this, uh, inside a you know, uh, condo environment or a virtual environment or something like that. So scikit-hep um, sort of started out with the uh, uh, idea of, of sort of mimicking the, the toolkit idea from, from root. So there was actually a package called scikit-hep and it had several different things in it, like units, vectors, statistics. Um, and it looks like this uh, figure on the left. And that's what, it, that's what it started as, but it started moving toward this tool set idea where it's just a collection, an organization of different, of different um, packages that each provide a very specific need, and then, have, and then uh, they work together well. Um, and so you'll see this sort of move as we, move, as we go along. One thing that happened, though, is that uh, the scikit -hep package was placed inside a scikit -hep organization, and the, uh, we started uh, inviting some of these other projects that were doing quite well in Python to join us. And we actually got um, several of the, the big packages at the time. So root numpy and root pandas came over from root pi, which the, the root pi project was sort of winding down. This is, a, this is not pi root. This is not the official bindings. This was a third party edition. Uh, it was sort of winding down. The original author was moving on. Um, but he gave us a couple of the, the key packages from that system, uh, ecosystem. We got a, a couple of simulation packages, um, PyJet and Pythia there, uh, that were bindings to those. And uh, possibly the, the most um, popular package to join was iMinui, which was a uh, uh, popular binding to, to um, the Minui fitting package. It's actually a quite popular in astronomy as well. And then we came. Then came the first sort of major new package that was part of Scikit-Hep, and this was Uproot. Uh, and this it, this this code is basically doing exactly the same thing you saw on the previous slide, but this is what I would consider much more Pythonic. So now we have uh, some NumPy arrays here. We're not having to take a single value and use that as a pointer, and then we can just use a, a with block, and then we just assign the um, the data structures in. This is structured data. Just assign it in, and that will uh, create a root file. And it was both the originally a reader, and then as you see here, also a writer for root files. And this was pure Python. So this was a, a huge game changer at the time, because it meant that you could now just pip install something and open your root files in Python. You didn't have to um, build, spend several hours building root and find, getting dependencies and attaching it to a specific Python and usually having it live somewhere else. This was just pip install. Um, and then sort of the first general package that's, that came along that was uh, general to other, to other um, domains was Awkward Array. And this is one of several packages that sort of was developed to support Uproot. Because Uproot was reading these, these, data, these data formats, and, and of course sometimes they are rectangular arrays like this, but sometimes they are jagged arrays, which look like this, where you have um, some, some uh, variable dimension. You might have one or more variable dimensions. And so this jagged uh, structured format um, became awkward array. And this uh, was originally written also in pure Python. And then uh, as you'll, you'll see later, as, we, as it moved along, it ended up um, becoming a compiled package uh, as well. But it was one that was sort of very native to the, the Python ecosystem. Um, and this was originally focused at HEP. It's now being developed for a variety of different fields. It's being used in astronomy, um, single cell genomics, uh, and oceanography, for example. And this is just a look at the, the um, sort of uptake of these, of these packages. You can see um, sort of the uh, timeline over on the left. You have the uh, sort of use of PyRoot versus uh, C++. And then you can see this, the scikit-hep packages starting to get used here starting in about 2016. This is um, 
just looking at the CMS experiment because it's it's easy to pull out that one experiment's um, uh, uh, forks basically of their repository, um, and you can still see even in this that, that it's starting to get used. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how um, psych, uh, how we build Scikit-Hep, how we started um, producing these. Uh, these packages, especially binary packages, which was really important for us because we have giant data sets. We needed to be able to compete in terms of performance. So uh, I'm going to look at histograms. This is something I was heavily involved in, and it sort of uh, preceded the the change in Awkward and several of our other packages. These things were, develop were, um, uh, were developed here and then uh, adapted to those packages. So there's, there were several things that had to be done. We needed uh, reliable bindings that were that were um, able to talk between um, C++ and Python because a lot of our, our uh, code, a lot of our knowledge was already in C++. Um, we needed to be able to build these binaries in a reliable way and ship them out so that they're very easy to use in clusters, on students' computers, wherever, wherever you might be. Um, and then we needed to have things talk together since we were focusing on small individual packages that each did one, one thing well. So PyBind 11 was chosen for the binding tools. Um, the, we had experience with uh, PyBind 11, Cython, and Swig at the time. And uh, this, this really fit, fit our needs very, very well because it had a very simple build. You don't have to pre-process and, and Swig or Cythonize things. Um, the distribution story for this is very good. You don't have to um, have the, the, uh, a particular version of NumPy already on the system to build, uh, which causes a variety of problems. And then um, it had very powerful um, templating because it's really just C++ and you can use C++ templates and you can generate um, things using, using C++ templates. Um, we ended up in, uh, uh, integrating a lot of improvements upstream. Um, we, end up, we have shared maintainership now. And uh, both Awkward 1.0 and uh, Minui 2 ended up moving, uh, using or moving over to uh, PyBind 11. So, then when you have, once, you've, once you have bindings, you ne then need to build them. And building redistributable wheels is not straightforward. It's the, the, the uh, picture is a bit easier for Conda because you have Conda Forge, and uh, we support that. But um, being able to just pip install it is really important, and building wheels was a challenge. Here's, here's just a little bit of an idea of the, the complexity of building wheels. You have to deal with different ways to, um, to get Python itself. You have to have the official download C Python download for Mac OS if you want to target anything but the Mac OS you're running on. Um, there's Docker images for Linux. Um, then there's a post-processing step that varies depending on what system you're on. There's a variety of different architectures you need to, need to target. Uh, and then there's things like testing and support for PyPy and um, Musa Linux came along at some point, etc. So the first attempt at this was a package called um, Azure Wheel Helpers, which was designed around the, at the point brand new uh, Azure platform. The Azure pipelines, and uh, this was a, a great learning experience. You do have there. I uh, posted a, a series of articles over sort of how this works. This is still a fairly good source for sort of understanding some of the the complexities of building redistributable wheels. But it really uh, ran. We ran into some um, problems. So it's really heavily tied to one uh, CI system, Azure, at the time. Um, it's most, mostly was written in, in YAML files, so it was hard to do all of the, the nice things that, say, you could have with the Python package where you can run um, tests and code quality tools and things like that. Uh, and, of course, it had a relatively small number of users, but we did move over our binary packages to this system. These five packages were all running off of uh, Zero Wheel help, Helpers at one point. So uh, then... <clears throat> We, uh, I was watching a package called CI Build Wheel, which looked like it was very close to our needs. Uh, ended up merging some of the things that we had developed as part of Azure Wheel Helpers into CI Build Wheel, like better um, um, window support, the ability to do um, version control for your versioning. And uh, we, we used PEP 5.17, 5.18, so uh, better support for that. And then we ended up uh, joining that project. We moved all of our packages over, uh, and Azure Wheel Helpers was, was archived. In fact, we pushed to, to get CI Build Wheel into the Python Packaging Authority. And since then, we've uh, put in a variety of different uh, of things into uh, CI Build Wheel that have helped our packages as well as the other 600 or so packages like uh, Matplotlib and things that build off of this, um, like static configuration, 
uh, the ability to build from S, S disks, um, some automatic, it'll check for your Python versions and just build the Python versions you support, things like that. And this is this was a actual Python package, so we were able to put in all of the static typing and, and code quality tools that you would expect for a Python tool um, to help keep this maintained and tested, which is a, a huge, huge um, benefit over what we'd had before. And then finally, for the um, we developed this the system. So we had these different packages. Boost Histogram was a, a C++ Boost library that we were, were wrapping, and we were working with the original Boost Histogram author. Um, He's also now part of Scikit-Hep. And um, we built our wrapper. And then we had a, a, a tool on top of that called Hist, which added in a lot of extra features that are useful for analysis and working with these interactively. And then you have, we have these other packages like Uproot that they don't really want to depend on Boost Histogram. They, you know, they, Uproot itself is just pure Python. It didn't want to build, uh, depend on a, a C++ package. So how should these things be related? So well, what we did is we created a static protocol. And we spent um, weeks arguing about each, each detail, um, but we finally came, across, uh, came up with a um, structure that everybody was happy with. And this, defines, this protocol defines expected behaviors for your producers, and you then have consumers that then expect those, those behaviors. So UHI is a package but it's actually not a runtime dependency. You, Uproot does not depend on UHI, um, but it, because it supports those protocols, it will support anything that UHI supports, including all these other packages. So any one of these can talk to any one of these others. They can pass a plottable histogram through, and uh, just, it just works because it depends on this. So this is a quick example of what a protocol is. Um, this is a very simple, just a duck, duck protocol. Uh, this is very much sort of a, a formalized version of duck typing. Uh, you see we have a duck, um, and ducks simply have to have a, be able to quack. And then for uh, if you're producing a, a, uh, a duck, so you make some my duck, some class, you simply have to implement that. If you implement that, MyPy will then pass this check, or whatever um, type checker you like to use. So, and this is, again, this can be entirely uh, static. Um, this is not in runtime. This is just a, a static check. Um, and then you can provide this protocol, and it passes. For a consumer, you just tell it that it's going to take a duck, and MyPy or your type checker will tell you if you use anything outside of this protocol, because you're not allowed to do that. Okay, so unlike a, an ABC, an abstract base class, this is all completely static and no runtime dependencies. Okay, so this is a, a, a look at the success of histograms over time. You see the, there's a long, large variety of different attempts to do a, a histogram library. Um, and this is histogram hist and MPL hep usage um, after it was introduced in about 2019 or late 2018. Um, so this is, this is just a look at how all of these different pieces of these, if you build a tool set, how all of, the, all of these things work together. So uh, this is a, a package called Uproot Browser, and this uses both uh, things from the data science ecosystem, it uses things from the Python ecosystem, and it uses things from scikit-hep. So um, the interface here is put together by Textual. This is a rich and rich and Textual UI, so it's in your terminal. You can just scroll around, click on, click on uh, trees, expand them, etc. Um, it's loading up Uproot files. So this is a root file, and you can see all the contents inside. Um, the data itself is often awkward. It's fine. It's using awkward array there. Um, and once you click on something, it uses hist to do a quick um, histogram over the data. This is actually stored. You can store histograms in the file, but a lot of this is actually stored in the array or awkward array sh uh, shape. Uh, and then it plots over that and then um, renders that through plot text. Okay, so this is a very similar functionality we had in root, but now this runs inside a terminal and you don't need to connect a, an X dis display or anything and you can still look through your, look through your um, files. In fact, if you press the right key or click on the, the dump, uh, dump, it will actually spit out exactly the uh, uproot commands you would need to load this file and grab that same thing out in Python. Okay, so this is, uh, we also support the, the broader ecosystem. So this is an idea of what the ecosystem looks like today. Scikit-hep is mostly the outer of the rings except for that inner core. So we build on top of matplotlib, uh, numba, numpy, these, these other tools. But and then we have our core tools, which are also useful. Most of these are useful outside of hep. And then we have more of our hep specifics, our domain, our very sort of domain specific things. Um, and then our, 
uh, you're sort of going domain specific as you go up, similar to the shells pictures you've seen. Um, so scikit-hep is not quite all of these. We also have the idea of an affiliated package. You can see um, Gufit, Kofia, uh, Zfit. These are packages that are affiliated with us um, and sort of work with us, use our tools, um, but are, are separate from the scikit-hep organization. And then we've uh, had a, we've really tried to, to upstream as many possible contributions. So we've, we've contributed and even share maintainership in a lot of these, these packages that we use. Um, and we've, we've upstreamed things to Knox and Matplotlib and various, various other things like that. So one of the things that came out of this that uh, allowed us to then take, sort of take the developments we had done um, heavily toward histogramming, but all, but all the develop, shared developments that we've done, and then make sure that all of our, our packages met a certain quality level and were able to, to utilize these things was the scikit-hep developer pages. So scikit-hep developer pages uh, sort of addressed a, a specific need. So scikit-hep was growing. We were growing a number of packages. We were growing a number of users. And uh, we needed to, to sort of share these developments across all of the packages. And just having somebody like me going out and, and changing every, all the other packages was not, uh, was not feasible. So what we did is we developed the scikit-hep developer guidelines. And so this covers a variety of, of topics. You can see the, some of the topics listed over there. Uh, it started out mostly with packaging, style guide, um, and then GitHub Actions. And then these other things were added over time as people had more requests and as we sort of developed best practices for these things. Uh, and it helped guide these, the other packages uh, to, to use the, the developments that we had, we had worked on, uh, like Awkward. And these, the uh, developer pages are universally useful. There's uh, anything that's HEP specific is very clearly marked and it's really, it's, it's basically a, a page of the, the beginning page of the developer guidelines. Everything else is, is intended to be uh, quite general. And also has some uh, utilities which I'll be showing you uh, as well, like the um, cookie cutter, which allows you to quickly produce a, a package yourself. And then, and then it uses its own best practices in developing it. So to find it, just scikit-hep.org, and then click on developer pages in either of these two locations, and that will take you to the developer pages. So for style, these are the guidelines we have for style. These are the things that we, we recommend. We tell you how to set everything up. This is all using um, the pre-commit tool, which is a fantastic tool. Um, and um, we have suggestions for using the, each of these different things for MyPy type checking, um, ways to set up Flake 8 and things like that, and even some recommendations for things like PyLint, which can be quite noisy. So um, one of the things that came along here through is the, uh, a, the uh, this was happening as, as uh, sort of simple packaging was being uh, developed this, uh, with pyproject.toml. So this is really all you need today to do a, to do a package. Um, so, Cookie Cutter can actually generate pack, um, packages, both in the classic style, binary packages, as well as these simple, uh, simple forms, um, like we recommend Hatchling. And then uh, the Scikit-Hep repo review was a tool, and it's actually a, a um, WebAssembly tool that you can just go in, you can enter in your repository, and it will tell you which guidelines you're following and which ones you're not. So this has uh, helped us check various packages and see how closely they were following our guidelines. So I just wanna, um, Briefly mention where we're going in the future with this. Um, one thing we're very excited about, scikit build. Um, we have a three-year plan. I'll be working on this for the next three years. Um, we'll be introducing uh, a new uh, PEP 517 backend, a simple configuration. We're getting rid of the sort of setup tools, dist utils, um, backend, and um, converting some projects that we've identified and um, building materials to make this sort of the, the best and simplest way to build binary packages on uh, using Python. You can see the proposal there, and uh, I'm pleased to announce that that was actually awarded yesterday at 2 p.m. So I will be doing this for the next three years. And then the last thing I want to mention for our, our, uh, sort of our plans is uh, we're also interested in WebAssembly. We've added Boost Histogram to PyDide, and uh, we'll be working, we've been working on improving the CMake support there. Um, Obviously, scikit build. We'll are making sure that that is uh, supported, and um, I mean, is sort of the next thing that we have targeted. That's most almost there, uh, and then awkward array. We plan to get into uh, 
to uh, PyDide as well. So you can actually go to numpy.org, type in the lines you see here, and it'll, you can actually see a histogram plotted with, with a boost histogram. Okay, uh, with that, I'm happy to take any uh, questions that you might have. Thanks for that great talk, Henry. Uh, we do have quite a few questions, so we'll try and get through uh, as many as we can. I'm just going to go in order. Um, so Stuart had asked, uh, this is related to CI build wheel, what's the current status of Windows uh, post-processing? So Devel wheel in CI build wheel, is it ready for general use at this point? So we still haven't activated it by default. It's, rec it's recommended in our, our documentation. Um, We'd need a little bit more feedback from people act actively using it. I have not heard of anybody complaining about it, but uh, I think we need a little bit more feedback from people actively using it. For things like Boost Histogram, we've avoid having um, things linked in, so you don't really need a tool to, to bundle in your dependencies. But uh, I know a few people are using it successfully, um, but it hasn't, hasn't changed to the default yet. I think that will probably happen, though, in the future. Uh, thanks. And then we have a question for David, uh, who asks, uh, can you say a little bit about how the scikit-hep development teams uh, were able to do all of this dev work that feeds back into the broader ecosystem uh, that he expresses thanks for? So in comparison to some of the uh, other domains like astrophysics, does it just happen to be like just the right place and right time right now? Is it part uh, due to dedicated roles for research software engineers in high energy physics and in iris -HEP? Uh, it, is, it helps that we do have um, some people like um, I'm, several of us are very sort of general, so we're able to spend some of our time on that. I spend quite a bit of time on several of these packages, and that has helped quite a bit. Uh, and then I think it's also, you, you need to just try to, if you find something that you can improve, you need to just try to write a really nice pull request and, and put it in, maybe start with an issue, try to understand what the, that, the package that you're using, what they're, what how they like to, to receive improvements, and then you know, very gently push for it and see if, and see if you can get things in. Um, so that's sort of how a lot of this started, and then we ended up, so I, uh, we ended up getting some shared maintainership across these, these packages over time. I'm going to slightly abuse chair privileges and uh, mention that there's a boff about research software engineering uh, this, this evening, so might push for people to go to that if they're interested in David's question. Um, all right, and then we also have a question from Eric. Uh, how does the protocol dependency get expressed? Is it part of the package requirements metadata, or is it just a development time dependency or part of the DevOps automation? So it's um, there are a few packages that pick it up as a runtime dependency because it has a few other tools that are useful, and it's not. It's just a tiny Python package. But for things like Uproot, it is picked up during the type checking phase. So inside your pre your pre commit file, you can specify environment or you do specify environments for each thing, and you would include that as a requirement for MyPy. So whenever you get whenever you do the type check um, job, and if you want to do this through Knox or Talks, you could do that too. Um, that's where you'd specify that. It's not a, an actual runtime dependency in most cases. It doesn't, it doesn't need to be in any any case. All right, and I think we have time for just one more question. Um, but uh, I've added Henry to the uh, room's uh, channel, so he'll uh, be able to follow up on Slack with any of it for any others. Um, so this is a question for me. So I'm again expressing chair privilege. Uh, now that Scikit Build uh, has, and I have some inkling of this, but I'm kind of pushing this as a comment. <laughs> uh, now that Scikit Build has been awarded funding, congratulations again. Uh, and uh, NanoBuild is now being developed. Uh, can you kind of comment on how you see these tools being adopted inside of Scikit-Hep and uh, maybe beyond? So we will definitely be working on uh, getting Scikit-Build uh, inside Awkward. That's actually listed in the in the grant. Um, I think we have several other packages that are, are that's using CMake and then just manually um, wrapping that, and that would be much would be much better to use a tool like Scikit-Build because. We have to maintain those those wrappings and change it every time something changes. Um, so iMenui is is an example. I think those will will probably be moved over as well. Boost Histogram might. It's currently using a. It has both a CMake file and a separate complete pure Python build system just because um, it needs to be able to build everywhere. But it shouldn't it shouldn't need to have two build systems. It should be able to just have one. So that might that might move over as well. So most of our binary packages really have either some use or 
a strong need for um, something like SciCat Build. All right, uh, thanks so much, Henry, and let's thank our speaker again. <clears throat> if you are if you are interested in any of those other, if in the sort of the PyBind 11 things, I'll be giving a maintainer's talk as well on that tomorrow. I'll go into more detail on what's happening there.